Hello and welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I'm Matthew Lucas. And we post a gardening video every week, so why not subscribe and press the alert button so that you'll be reminded. And don't forget to send us in a comment or a question and I will hopefully answer it on our Monday shorts. <laughs> so why not indeed get fully engaged? You will, and very generous too. But Stephen, talking of generosity, your gorgeous garden behind us, yeah. what are we talking about today? Well, we're going to get down and dirty. Uh, we're going to. I'm wearing white shorts. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, that's just too bad. And I'm wearing a very pale green shirt. But anyhow, what we're going to talk about today is soil preparation and what I had to do to create the soil that I'm working with today. Mm. Because I'll. Oh, it's a little bit of a spoiler alert. I didn't have any when <laughs> I first started my garden. So we're going to talk about how this all evolved. Wonderful. Well, I think that is fantastic because we have alluded to this over mm -hmm. different videos about the compost that we, the compost video we made. Yeah. So it's going to be fantastic for us to show the whole process. But okay. I think we should start perhaps next door in the paddock next door to show everyone exactly what this place looked like. What a good Before idea. the advent of Stephen. Yes. So BS. we have, yes, we have, before, well, before Stephen and we have a before and hopefully an after that you'll be able to engage. Excellent. With. Let's yes. go. What a good idea. Now, Stephen, we're just off to investigate your soil. What do I see before me but agapanthus? Yes. I'm here to say, Stephen Ryan, I am surprised you're growing agapanthus. People see me as some sort of horticultural snob. Horty culture. Yes, exactly. But, you know, every plant can have its place in a garden. Okay. And I find agapanthus, as long as I deadhead them so they don't seed all through our forests, yes. as very useful workhorses in the right. garden. Right. And they do give me a bit of summer colour, which I'm always very grateful okay. for. Okay, well, we'll forgive you. Agapanthus, here they are, living their best life. Yes. <laughs> Let's carry on on the soil story. What a good idea. All right, Stephen. So... This is what it was. Yes, we're actually in the paddock next door to my property and it's mainly to show you the before, which in fact is dry sclerophyll forest. Mm -hmm. Because the eucalypts are the dominant tree species here, yeah. uh, when they do shed, they shed dry, fairly nutrient poor material. So you never build up a good garden soil mm. uh, naturally mm. uh, in a um, dry sclerophyll forest. Mm. So this is what I inherited was this sort of soil yeah. uh, or lack thereof. Which I, it does look to my eye very barren and yeah. It is. For unforgiving. <laughs> yes, it, it's it's dreadful stuff. It's a yellowy clay. It has a few pebbles through it. And I quite literally tell everybody that when I started gardening, my topsoil was the grey smudge under the gum leaves. That was it. So there's a, we've just taken a shot of your garden from the paddock. The other thing that's obvious is that literally your garden is now higher ground. And is that literally by dint of the layers you've been building up over the decades? Yes, although it's, it didn't start off by putting layers on top because mm. that never works. Uh, you end up with a layer cake effect and roots will go down to a certain level and then not be able to go further because they'll hit that dreadful clay soil. Mm. So what I actually did is... I dug a trench mm. uh, and I tried to get down two spade depths, mm. which we call double digging, but I couldn't always because there were true roots and rocks and other things in the way. But where possible, I got down to two spade depths and I started in one corner of the garden. I dug the trench. I then put that soil or clay, really not mm. soil, to the side. Yeah. And as I started filling, oh, and I broke up the bottom of the trench as well with a crowbar so that there was no layer anywhere. So really, I got down even further than two spade depths. This is already a lot of work, Stephen. Yeah, but look how fit and strong and muscly I am. Um, so anyhow, I broke up the bottom and then I started putting materials into the trench. Mm. So it became my compost bin. So I didn't need a compost bin to start with. So any kitchen scraps and rubbish from the house went straight in. Mm. Uh, I used to bring home spent material from the nursery. So dead plants, prunings, spent potting mix, which became a huge component of my um, soil preparation. Um, and I'd also go out and I'd buy bags of manure on the side of the road. Yeah. I used to rake up other people's lawns and bring all their lovely oak leaves and maple leaves home. Anything organic I could lay my hands on and I would be putting that in the trench. But as I was putting it in the trench, I would be digging the next trench next door and the clay from that trench would be mixed through the materials that went into the first trench. Uh -huh. So that by the time I'd filled that trench, I'd not only made it much higher than it was from the initial soil level, but I'd already dug the second trench, ready to start work on that. 
How long did this take you? You've got a fairly large garden. Yeah, we're working on uh, a little over an acre. Mm. Uh, and apart from the driveways and the paths, every square inch of our garden has been double dug. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I didn't bring in truckloads of soil. I mean, I bought in truckloads of compost and mulch where I could get it. And grass clippings. Yeah, and anything I could lay my hands on. Uh, but I didn't bring soil in because bringing in other soils, often they don't blend and, and work well with your existing. Mm. Uh, you can also bring in new weeds and diseases. Mm. Uh, so I didn't do any of that. So everything was done by building up the soils that way. Mm. But it's hard work. But once it's done, you can start planting fairly soon afterwards. Mm. Uh, and I just started planting as I went. So I didn't have to do the whole back garden before I started planting. Mm. I'd have two, two, perhaps three trenches ahead of myself and I'd be planting in the corner. In fact, it was known to dig a hole and an old orange peel would pop out of the ground or goodness knows what else. Uh, never stopped me. I just kept planting. And so I worked all the way across the garden uh, doing that. But I don't have to redig it ever again. Mm -hmm. So that's where the saving comes out in the end. Okay. Well, I think we should now go back into your garden and look at an area that you've been working on and we can look at it a bit more specifically. Yeah, what a good idea. Let's go. All right. So... Once I've prepared the ground and I've started my planting. And taken a lot of blood, sweat and tears to yes, do it. Yes, yes. So uh, once I've done the initial preparation and laid out my beds and planted them, then there's the ongoing work that needs to be done. Mm. And we have got a video about composting and recycling in the yep. garden and all that sort of thing. So yep. obviously we'll link that. We will, but um, we will also go to the composting yep. this time because you've just emptied one bin and we can actually see the side of the yeah. other one. And yeah, so we'll be able to look at the layers. Which yes. is very interesting. Now, I did want to make the point though that the original soil preparation, as I said, I got whatever materials I could get, but one of the most useful materials has turned out from my perspective to be, because mm. I have one access to it and, um, and two for free, and that was spent potting mix coming mm. from my nursery. Mm. So I always bring buckets of spent potting mix home. And the reason that's such a useful addition to my soil preparation regime is that it's full of sand and fine gravel and things. And those materials, once mixed through the um, existing clay, they stay there forever. Your humus materials, your compost, your manure, and all those other things, yeah. they will help open up a clay soil fairly long term but not forever yeah. and so you need to then spend time topping those things up all the time so nice. it's a long-term process obsessive mulching could be one of my failings but there you go let's go through this piece by piece because actually in this area there are three different stages going on yes so this is obviously an established part of your garden yep, yep. it was dug and Double dug. You double dug. Double yes. dug, yep. whatever. How many decades ago would this have been dug? Uh, this would have been done probably only a decade and a half ago, so 15 years ago or oh, something okay. like that. Okay. Um, and I still remember using this area out here also for temporary mulch piles uh, of composty materials that hadn't broken down yet enough to put into the ground. Mm. So I had a big pile of stuff sitting over in the corner over there and I was digging that in as I was as I was creating the, the beds. Right. So yeah, about 15 years ago, maybe a little longer, but not much. All right. And so what's going on today? Because there's right. definitely three stages. Yes. Well, the first thing I do whenever I go in to remulch and revitalize a bed yeah. is to go through and weed it. Yes. So that's the first step. Now, I'm going to say this is quite a large bed and yes. this is all the weeds. And a lot of these are drop leaves that you have pulled. So one of the side effects Yes, of my of, regime. Of your regime is not many weeds and yep. your garden is not weedy. No, and it never has been and it never will be because once the preparation is done mm. and everything is properly mulched, then you don't get a lot of weed growth. And in fact, the biggest weeds I have tend to be self-sown tree seedlings, which will s germinate into the leaf mould and, and, and mulch that I put down. Yeah. And I then have to go around and pull out elderflowers or sycamores or so whatever up, that's come up. Above us is a Sambucus and you were saying that they were the seedlings you were pulling out. Yeah, so yeah so dozens of them, but there you go. Now we're going to go and visit another garden um, in this video, which is a, a different garden, which had a different story about yeah. soil preparation. And we'll go into the weed suppression bit a bit more because yeah. there's a different story to tell there. Yeah, so, so that's right. So first I go through and I clean out weeds and I fluff. That didn't take you long. No, but I fluff at the same time. Oh. Yes, I get my fork in and I fluff up the ground a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that breaks tension. It means that when we do get some decent rain, 
the rain can get in because it hasn't become a an impenetrable hydrophobic surface. So where does that fit in with the, the sort of the new fashion for no digging but just adding? Well it's almost the opposite <laughs> and look the no dig garden is perfectly legitimate and fine if you're growing vegetables and flowers and 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 short-term plants yeah. but when you're growing larger trees and shrubs they need to have at least you know sort of 18 inches to two feet of good topsoil mm. uh in the imperial measurements and if you and, don't have that you've got to make it well exactly because the roots need to be able to get down and anchor themselves well i mean yeah. trees don't go down terribly deeply you don't have to go down deep deep but you don't want to have any impenetrable layers if you can manage it so you break up the lowest layer yeah. uh, and then you just keep adding and adding and then you end up with about as i said 18 inches of topsoil is good mm. it also means that you've gone down into the clay so what happens then is when you're watering when the water soaks through the good soil you've created goes down and it hits the clay subsoil yeah. and because the clay subsoil is lower than your paths and other sand, sundry areas it holds it in place. So what happens for me is when I'm watering in the summer, if the soil hasn't got so dry that it just won't accept water, it will go down, hit the clay at the bottom and stay there. Whereas if I'd prepared above the existing clay and not gone down into it, it would what, run off. Well, in fact, you could be standing there watering the garden and you'd turn around and the water's running straight down the driveway. Yeah. So it'll just go under the mulch and disappear down the driveway. So, Interesting. so that way it helps keep moisture on site. Also, when you get good heavy rains, it holds some of that rainwater in instead of letting it disappear. And so the double digging and the extra work I've put in has paid dividends in watering. It's also paid dividends in plant growth. People get far too impatient to get something in the ground and they won't put the preparation work in, the plant will either die or it'll sit there sulking and looking miserable at you, which is even worse. It's all about soil health. And yeah. this, I mean, this is part of the organic movement yep. too, which is not necessarily about the food itself, but it's about the soil health and yep. the environmental health of all the ancillary yep. insects. You can't grow healthy food unless you've got healthy soil. There you go. Yeah. So why this is why there are soil associations in well, just about every country. Yeah, exactly. And you know, and this is why when you create really good soil out of good organic and natural products, then mm. you'll go grow good trees, good shrubs, good fruit, good vegetables. But like anything in life, you get out of it what you put in. So unless you're prepared to keep the process going yes. until you become part of the process, which could happen. Are you going uh, to be buried on site? Steve? No, I'm not. I, I just find that a little bit. You could be scattered. So well, yeah. let's let's park that conversation. Yes, yes. Let's get back. All right. To what so, you're doing. so weeding and fluffing. Weeded and fluffing. Yeah. yeah. Then I get barrow loads of my beautiful homemade compost, which we'll go and show you. In yeah. A bit. And and that's laid out here. Now, so just just to pause then, this area here, which I'll show you in close up, yeah. you have just weeded, fluffed, and added the compost on yeah. top. And that's just gone on top. So you're uh, not digging the compost in, it's no, just on top. It just goes on top. Yeah. But because I basically cull compost and lots of weeds and other things end up in my compost heap, I also get a lot of germinating weed seeds that come up in the compost when I lay it out on the garden. So yes. I have to make uh, allowances for that. So when I've put the compost down, mm -hmm. I very soon afterwards mm -hmm. put down, well, in my case, the next layer is often a nice deep sprinkling of coffee grounds, which you mentioned which before. Here. Yeah, yeah. The, so the coffee grounds are there. Uh, they're never deep enough to actually be a weed suppressant, but they have a bit of nitrogen in them. I have found where I've used um, coffee grounds before if there's a reasonable amount of it the worms seem to enjoy it all the compost worms come up into it and love it so that seems to work very well and I have access to quite a lot of coffee grounds from one of the local cafes so I bring home rubbish bins full of coffee from them they're pleased because they get rid of uh, a waste material they don't want. Mm. I bring it home and my garden smells of coffee for quite a while afterwards. Uh, Which is not unpleasant. It's not unpleasant. So I put down the coffee grounds and then I mulch over the top of that. Okay, so the mulching is here, which we'll mm. show you. Now, what is in the mulch? Now, in our composting video, we did look at your... your yes, your, my big red shredder. Your big red shredder, which is yep. right over there. So what is in the mulch and why isn't that in the compost bin or doesn't it talk us through it? All right. Uh, the things that go through the shredder tend to be the things that are much woodier and chunkier yeah. that would take far too long if I put them into the compost heap to right. deal with them there. And that so, becomes the mulch. And that becomes the mulch. The so woodier... twigs, branches, fern fronds, um, hedge trimmings, um, any of that sort of stuff that can go through the shredder Fairly soon afterwards, depending on what level I'm at in the actual preparation, it goes down onto the ground, hopefully before the 
compost that went underneath it's gets a chance to germinate, to germinate seedlings in. So I try and get that covered as quickly as possible. So in an ideal world, would you kind of do it on the same day? You'd lay... Within a few days. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Normally, uh, I'm getting to an age now where I don't do that sort of job completely all day long. So yeah. I tend to swap my jobs around. So I'll come out and I might weed for half an hour, an hour. Then I'll have a nice section opened up. So I'll then go and bring over some compost from the compost heap. Yeah. That's hard yakka, digging it out of the compost heap because it's quite heavy. Mm. I'll put that down. I'll spread some uh, coffee grounds on it. And then fortunately the shreddings that I'm using for mulch are fairly light and easy. So mm. I just get my pitchfork out and I bring over barrel loads of that. So I can do a section, a reasonable size one in a day, but then I'll go off and water and do something else just to sort of break it up. So then the last question, how often would you do this? There's no real, uh, well, I'd love to be able to say that I do it probably biennially, get round the whole garden within two years. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really a matter of materials. Mm -hmm. So if I've got the materials at hand, then I get stuck into it and I cover as much area as I can get away with. Mm -hmm. And I always try and pick an area that hasn't been done recently and that may be a little weed infested that I can then bring back into a nice tidy order again. Yeah. Um, sometimes when I do clean up an area too, I do a little bit of pruning of things and tidying up as I go. Yeah. So sometimes that creates a space in which I can plant something else. So I do that as I go. And actually we will do a little sub story about the two things you've planted, just, mm. just for context. Yep. There's yep. something I want to ask you about over here. Yeah, yes. well, that sounds fair. Uh, and then when I've mulched around them, I can walk away from that bed for at least 18 months, two years. Uh, I might have to go in and just do a little tiny bit of hand weeding. I was going to say, how often then would you have to weed in between this process? Not that often. Not that often. Uh, once or twice. I mean, we've got a bed behind us here that I haven't done. And if you look at this, we'll put some footage in. There's a little bit of forget-me-not that's come up. There's a, a, a little bit of Herb Robert, Geranium Robertsianum, which I don't really worry about terribly much. I'll pull it out and throw it in the compost heap. Mm. But really, there's not much weedy material in there, and that hasn't been mulched for two years. Right. And again, that is all you took out of this area, yep. which I think is remarkable because, you know, weeding is just a thing that people constantly talk about. Well, firstly, let's, we'll just move the camera in a minute and have yep. a look at these three things that I'm curious about. Yep. Then we should go and look at the compost bin and yes. just see where that's at. Because the last time we filled it, each of the three areas was full. But now one is empty. Yeah, so we've got yeah. an empty compost bin ready for more stuff. Okay, but yes. now let's look closely at these things. All right. All right, so I mentioned that I do a little bit of replanting as we go along. I've had this Oracaria rulii, which is a very rare monkey puzzle relative from New Caledonia, sitting around in a pot for ages and been looking for the posse to put it in. And it's surprising how often when I sort of prune back and clean up some of the detritus of my bushes, uh, I suddenly have a gap. And of course, this will eventually grow into quite a tall tree. Uh, I'll have to think about how I open up a space if I live long enough, uh, up above it somewhere. But in the meantime, it's going to make a really interesting sculptural effect in the border. And also down at the base, I've just popped in a little miniature holly because I love the sort of textural quality of the leaves, the funny sort of triangular ends on them. It's a dwarf form of Ilex cornuta, the Chinese holly, and it goes under the rather appropriate name of rotunda. And it just makes a little round, bally type bush. It'll just sit nestled in underneath this bamboo and this nice oricaria just filling it up and hopefully over years it'll get harder and harder to get into the borders with mulch and coffee grounds and 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 spent compost and things as well so Stephen this was the thing that just intrigued me in the border that you're weeding fluffing mulching and coffeeing yes. what is this uh, it's one of the New Zealand pseudo panaxes or what are known as lance woods yeah uh, it's a seedling one uh, probably of uh, Pseudopanax lessonii, mm -hmm. and it's reasonably drought tolerant and it's reasonably shade tolerant, although it's probably in more shade than it needs here because it's sort of tending to flop and loll and wander around a tad. Yeah. But it's a lovely uh, foliage plant, and the Pseudopanaxes, of course, also make damn good indoor plants as well, so they're very good indoor pot plants. Do they? So, so how big is this going to get? All right, well, in the ground, on its own, without pruning, it could end up as a large shrub, three, maybe four metres tall. Yeah. Uh, but if you've got it in a pot that's going to restrain its growth habit a bit uh, and of course most of these things are quite prunable so you can take the top off and keep them down and bushy if you want to and in fact they'll reshoot from a stump so if I decided at some stage I needed to cut it down for whatever reason uh, it will come up from the stump again so okay there you go. So well it's a fabulous thing yeah it's a nice anyway, foliage plant we were on our way to the compost heap yeah let's go all right Stephen 
compost revisited the yes. lost Evelyn War novel. Yes. Last time we were here, big mound, a big mound of rotting fruit and veg, and here we are. Yes, we are. We've now emptied this one, so all of this compost has ended up on the garden bed I've been refreshing. And so now that it is empty, I'll be able to start filling this again. Yeah. The one on my right-hand side here was emptied about a month and a half ago, and as you can see, I've already got it pretty full, although it's going to drop down quite a way anyway. So I'll be able to keep topping this one up for quite a while. But now that this one's empty, I can start using this one. Yes. And the one on the left-hand side, which has been filled for a while now, the top will come off that onto one of these, and then I'll be able to start using the compost that's come out of there. So how long was this in here before you emptied it? How long did it take? It took about four months, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, so... And <laughs> oh, yes. did you want to make a public service announcement? I did want to make a public service announcement. Those little stickers that are on fruit drive me nuts because they end up with the peelings comes out into here yeah. of all the fruit and veggies and things. And I also bring home spent vegetables and fruit from the local supermarket as well to go in my compost. Yes. So, of course, I end up with lots of those little stickers and they seem to have the same half-life as a nuclear fusion bomb, I think. They just keep coming back up out of the compost. Plastic. Yeah, it drives me nuts. Oh, well, go. let's stick it on there. And let's go and look at this other garden and talk about the soil regeneration issues over there. What a good idea. Well, here we are in a historic garden that we have visited many times before. So we'll link the videos we've made before here. The garden is called Karuri. So many thanks to the generous owner who's let us film here today. Yes. But the thing is that this is about soil, not regeneration, but I guess it is, but with a different, I guess, angle to your situation, yes. your garden. So what was the story here? Well, the story here was that unlike me with my little gray smudge under the gum leaves, they've actually got two or three feet of dark brown mountain soil, basically, mm. uh, on this property. And so it wasn't a matter of creating soil, but it was a matter of some other issues that they needed to deal with before the garden could move forward. It had been neglected for a long time. Mm. So decades, decades, in fact, yes. And so there are a lot of um, issues with weediness. So mm. believe it or not, one of the biggest weeds in this garden was You're uh, laugh. Yes, Ulstromeria, which I know gardeners in Britain love and it's a wonderful cut flower. But here, yeah. well, on the mountains, it's certainly oh, it's a dreadful weed issue yeah. here and it's quite hard to manage. And yet the owners here have, in fact, with persistence and yes. dedication. Dogged persistence. Yeah. I saw this house uh, before the renovation started at mm. the garden and it was literally a sea of astromera. Yeah, and as pretty as it might be for the very short time it flowers, it had to go. So it's been mainly a weed issue. But the other thing that's interesting, and the owners have been putting extra things into the ground and mulching as well as managing their weed issues, uh, is that even though this is quite deep, chocolatey brown mountain soil, it tends to be reasonably low in major nutrients. So, so I'm surprised by that because it looks so chocolatey and yeah, rich. Yeah, you could eat it. You could. Yes, well, you wouldn't, but you could. But no, it's actually quite low in nitrogen. It's made up mainly of decomposed uh, volcanic rock with a very high component of humus because it's been in a temperate forest and it's had a lot of stuff falling on it over the years. Yeah. And so it's built up quite a lot of humus but it is actually comparatively low nutrient wise, which is fine for the rhododendrons and azaleas and things, which all come from similar sorts of conditions and don't need highly um, nutritious soil. In fact, their main issue is about having an acid soil, so they don't like an alkaline soil. But to create a good border in this garden with lots of perennials and other uh, hungry plants, then the ground has to be fed as well. Mm. And the owner does, as you do, a very heavy mulch at least once a year weed suppressants and as a yeah, fertilizer. It's a tonic -y thing, yeah. it, it adds to the soil, but it still needs to have high nitrogen level uh, materials put into it mm. on a regular basis to lift the uh, nutrient level for the broader palette of plants that the new owners want to grow. So a question then, I remember your question to the owner was, well, what's the dominant weed? Mm. So does your sort of strategy depend upon what that weed is in mm. terms of eliminating it? So I guess the Alstroemeria is a bulb, or is well, it a tuber? Uh, it's, yeah, it's more a tuber. Uh, Whereas you might have perennial weeds. So yes. what are the different techniques you use to suppress weeds? All right, well, if it's an annual weed or something, then you remove it and you get it out before it goes to seed, and then you wait for the next batch of seed to come up because there will be a seed mm. bank in the ground. Mm. So you just keep um, removing the weed and making sure it doesn't go 
to flower. Uh, um, so that works well with grasses and all that sort of stuff if you if they're annually grasses. Yeah. Perennials that have deep roots, you normally have to get down to get that base of the root out, things like dandelions, dockweed, those sorts of things. Uh, you've got to get down to quite a depth to get those roots out because if you break the root off, then the thing will come shooting straight back up again. Yeah. Uh, and in a sense, it's the same with the Alstroemeria. One, you've got to stop it going to seed because again, you'll end up with quite a, a long-term seed bank in the ground. So, mm. And in fact, I'm quite confident they'll still get the occasional Ulstrum area that will come back up again. Yeah. But you've got to actually I'm, get down. I'm scanning to see. I can't see any. Yeah, well, it's sort of towards the end of the Ulstrum area season now, too. It'll yeah. probably be collapsing even if it's still here anywhere. But I certainly can't see it around. So I think they've done a sterling job yeah. getting on top of it. And you've really got to get down and get those rhizomes out. They then have to be dealt with in such a way that they can't regrow in your garden. So you can't put them in the compost. Mm. You can't sort of deal with them in that sort of way. Mm. So they may have to be moved off site or you may have to put them in large black plastic bags and cook them in the sun for, for, for weeks and weeks on end. Or you'll put them in your septic tank pit. We've covered yep. that. Yes, what well, I would. I would do with, with that. tricky things. Yes, anything that I can't deal with in a simple and straightforward way goes down into my septic tank, never to be seen again. The worms deal with it. So uh, I think it's the best thing I ever, ever had put into my garden, but yeah. there you go. Well, it's been a tremendous success here because the this particular border is just flourishing. We'll show you pictures of what it looks like now. And it has been several years of a work in progress yeah, it to takes eliminate time. those weeds and build up the nutrient levels. So interesting. There you go. It all comes down to soil. Soil health, yes. soil health, yeah, soil health. Definitely. And so here we are in your glorious garden, the sum total of all of this hard work. Yes, Stephen exactly. Ryan. Well, you get what you put into things back. So there you go. This is a philosophy of life. It is. And gardening, I have to say, is one of those things that the makeover programs have really given people the wrong impression about. You cannot come in and create a garden in a week, walk away and expect it to perform into the future. Yeah. Uh, nor should you expect it to because gardening is not in fact a destination. It's a process that you'll keep going through your whole life as I have done with this garden some 35 years after I actually put it in place. There you are. Well, it's wonderful. So I hope this has been a little bit of an explanation of the Stephen Ryan philosophy of soil creation. Any questions, put them in the comments below and you will answer them. Yes, I will do my very best. And remember, if you've got another question, do put it in the comments below because Stephen uh, will answer them in our shorts every Monday. Yes, exactly. So get engaged with us. You know, we love feedback. We do. But if you want to know what we're doing next week, do hit subscribe. We post every Friday and you can join our continuing adventures. Yes. See you then. See you next week.